From Lansing Community College, this is LCC Connect, and this is Land Stories, with me, David Seawick. Each episode explores a different topic, such as the people, business, neighborhoods, communities, buildings, and other phenomena that make up the history of our college and our region. We tell stories, and in doing so, we connect the past to the present. In this episode of Land Stories, we continue our look into the olden days of Lansing baseball. And if you haven't had a chance to listen to our previous episode, I would encourage you to go back and do so as we are looking at the days of yore in Lansing, Michigan with professional baseball. And the Lansing Lugnuts are the professional baseball team that currently play in the city of Lansing. And that is an organization that has its presence in Lansing dating back to the mid-1990s, with 1996 being the first year that the Lansing Lugnuts played. The Lugnuts are affiliated with the Oakland Athletics. They've had uh, other affiliations as well, and the way affiliation works in baseball, for those of you that aren't uh, aficionados of the sport and all of its uh, seemingly strange ways of terminology and how teams are organized, The current system of minor league baseball in the United States has an association or an affiliation that many teams have in a formal structure with major league baseball. So the Detroit Tigers, for example, have a double-A affiliate, triple-A affiliate, single-A affiliate, oftentimes more than one actually, playing within one of those A distinctions, which is the tiered uh, system of minor league baseball, AAA being the highest, and then going down to double A, and then single A, and within single A, there's high A and low A, and then the rookie leagues, as they're called, which is sort of the initial starting point in the tiered uh, system of minor league baseball. Affiliation refers to a minor league team having a formal tie to a major league team. So, in the case of the Lansing Lugnuts, being affiliated with the Oakland Athletics means that. The players that play on the Lugnuts team currently are in the Oakland A's pipeline to the major leagues, meaning if a player in the Lansing Lugnuts continues to show that he is potentially of major league caliber or at least of good enough talent to advance to the next level, he will continue to do so and move up through the different minor league affiliated teams within the Oakland Athletics the Lugnuts being the high A affiliate, and maybe eventually one day end up playing for the Major League team. And there have been several baseball players that have played through the Lugnuts through the years that have played or have gone on to play in the Major Leagues. The Toronto Blue Jays were the previous Major League affiliate that the Lansing Lugnuts were associated with, and so there are several players through the years that have ended up playing for the Toronto Blue Jays that at one time stepped up to the plate here in Lansing. Now, this episode, though, will not, beyond that, discuss the Lansing Lugnuts. We're actually going to go back and continue looking at the history of, or the story behind, baseball in Lansing during the uh, long-ago era of the sport, and that is the early 1900s that we're focusing on here. And the team that uh, we've been talking about, or considering the most, is a team that was called the Lansing Senators. And the Lansing Senators played several seasons between 1889 and all the way up to 1941. The league that they played in had several iterations. It was called the Michigan State League for several years. And then that league ultimately disbanded at one point, formed again, called itself the Southern Michigan League, and then it uh, itself broke up and the Senators ultimately played in the leagues, a couple leagues that followed actually, including the Central League and then the Michigan State League finally in the early 1940s. So all in all, the Senators played from 1889 to 1890 and 1895. They played a season in 1897 And then they played another season in 1902 and then had a stretch from 1907 to 1914 
where the Southern Michigan League was able to survive for that long, and then that league itself ran into problems in 1914. And the Senators moved, actually, in the middle of the 1914 season to Mount Clemens. Mount Clemens is over in uh, Macomb County, away from Lansing, and then the team ended up coming back to Lansing, and in 1921 and 1922 played their seasons as part of the Central League. An attempt in 1940 and 41 um, to organize another league, the Michigan State League, uh, culminated in 1941 with a season, and the city team, the Lansing Senators, played that season. Then 1941 is the year that that iteration of the Michigan State League and the ultimate fate of the Lansing Senators is decided not by matters related to baseball, but because of the U.S.'s entrance into World War II. And so for a on-again, off-again period of time, the first 40 years of the 20th century and dating back into the latter part of the 19th century, the Lansing Senators had a presence as Lansing's professional baseball team playing in the minor leagues. What happens after that is, uh, or and even during that, is equally as interesting. And in the last episode of Land Stories, one of the things that I discussed was the cultural and social background of the game of baseball. And that's going to enter into the story of Lansing Baseball again in this episode of Land Stories, or this part two of our olden days of Lansing Baseball episode. And the sport of baseball is one that is absolutely ingrained within the very fabric of American culture as it uh, develops and grows, and especially as the United States becomes an urban and a suburban society. And that development, away from being a a country that most people were farmers in, which was the case in the United States until before the Civil War, to a country where there was a very mixed economy of farmers and then eventually factory workers and office workers and retail workers— That transformation of the American economy away from being one almost entirely dependent upon agriculture uh, to one that undergoes the Industrial Revolution and creates a society full of factory workers and office workers and retail workers and all the economic roles that, as part and parcel to urbanization of the society and the social changes that come with that, baseball develops side by side all of that and so the sport of baseball as i proposed in the previous episode one that is a playing out on the field in artistic form in many ways uh the roles of society american culture as it's developing at the time and so baseball players play in city parks the city park movement was a very important part of the urbanization of the united states urban reformers, as they were called, city planners. Folks all around the United States looked at the development of American cities and they said it would be healthy and helpful for the benefit of everybody who lived in cities if there were parks, places that people could have recreation time, fresh air, enjoying the outdoors, and and the thought or the idea of needing such recreational places was really not even in the mindset of most in the pre-Civil War era because most people, well, they worked on farms and so they lived outdoors most of the day. And the idea of recreation as being a way to get physical activity and exercise outdoors was something that, again, would have just been anathema on the mind of most people because it was entirely not thought of as something that people needed. They worked outdoors all day uh, doing hard physical labor on a farm, and therefore you need to exercise uh, outdoors to keep your body in good shape. Well, by the time we get to the early 1900s, many Americans have moved into cities, and there becomes a mindset or, or a realization that a lot of Americans 
don't get any exercise anymore or very little compared to what they once did. And this created an alarm amongst, well, every uh, order of society, including right up to the President of the United States. And Theodore Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, as he's better known to history, actually plays a really important part in this. Teddy Roosevelt was a huge fan of sports, not only baseball, but especially football, the version of football that is played in North America, which is very different than the sport the rest of the world calls football that we here uh, in this side of the Atlantic call soccer. But the development of football is a story that we'll cover in another day here on Land Stories, and, and we are going to do a future episode looking at the sport of football in Lansing and East Lansing and this area as a whole. And yes, that is going to involve considering the team that plays in East Lansing. That would be the Michigan State University Spartans. But for now, Teddy Roosevelt comes into the picture in the sense that he, one of the things he did as president is he was very public in encouraging Americans to become fit. Physical fitness is one of the key initiatives that Teddy Roosevelt had in his role as being sort of the cheerleader in chief. The uh, president who, and more than anybody up to that point, Teddy Roosevelt certainly was, a public figure who, rather than simply, or maybe not so simply, making his mark on society through legislation, Teddy Roosevelt understood that society at that point had presented itself with the opportunity of leaders persuading people by giving grand announcements and grand speeches and therefore advocating for something. So nowadays we may call this being an advocate or community organizer or having a cause that one stands up for and speaks out against in public. Back then it was known as a great endeavor that a person like Teddy Roosevelt would give primarily through public speaking. And Roosevelt was a master at public speaking. So one of the things that Roosevelt encouraged Americans to do was to go outdoors, to exercise, and to get fit. And the public municipal park movement that is developing in the United States at this time is part and parcel to that. And baseball, therefore, has yet another role to play in these important developments in American culture. We have talked about the Lansing Senators as a professional baseball team that has its start in Lansing at the very end of the 1800s, that would be the 19th century, and has several iterations, plays several seasons throughout the first decades of the 1900s, that would be the 20th century. However, the Senators were not the only baseball team nor were the various leagues that the Senators played in through their years the only organized baseball associations that had an impact on Lansing or other cities in Michigan, for that matter. And in 1928, the Lansing Baseball Federation formed as part of the Lansing Athletic Federation and athletic federations such as that in Lansing were groups that existed that tried to form organized sports. So organized sporting events that people could participate in who weren't professionals. Most of them were amateur athletics. Athletic organizations that formed community basketball leagues, for example. Basketball is starting to become a popular sport at this time period baseball as well and because as we all know by now baseball was an extremely popular sport in the United States at this time period many cities such as Lansing started to have baseball leagues pop up baseball leagues that were organized by and very much sponsored by companies or organizations and the players who played for these teams were the workers who worked at these companies or organizations. And these became known as city leagues because they were organized at the city level and primarily uh, consisted of teams and players 
who were from companies or organizations that existed in the city in which the City League was formed. So in Michigan, many cities had uh, City Leagues. Kalamazoo, Grand Rapids, Flint, Saginaw, and many other cities have it named, and certainly in including Lansing. And so the organization of the Lansing Baseball Federation started in 1928 was exactly this. It was an organization of companies and other organizations that came together to field teams, to organize a schedule, to organize a league, including a location that the city league teams could play their games at. And the Lansing Baseball Federation, therefore, is part of this overall movement of leisure and recreational activities being encouraged amongst the population. City leagues also had another component of the organization, and that was that because these were leagues that were sponsored by, in fact, organized by companies encouraging their workers to play on the teams, they became a form of worker loyalty and meaning a company believed it could gain some type of a loyalty or a commitment to working for that company by having its workers play in the company baseball team. At the outset, this statement may seem a little bit maybe um, like, well, you know, what's the big deal? Why would somebody want to keep working for a company just to play for the baseball team? But in, at the time period, this actually could be a major motivating factor um, because people really enjoyed playing baseball. And some of the men who played for these city league teams were really, really good. And in fact, the participation in these city leagues provided a great degree of enjoyment and personal enrichment and satisfaction out of life. And at the time period, uh, industrial labor, and that's to say not only working in a factory, but the other forms of work that existed at the time involved some pretty, uh, well, shall we say, tough working conditions. People worked long days back then. The eight-hour workday had certainly made its way into some industries, but not others at the time. So there were still places where people worked 9, 10, 11, 12-hour workdays, and wages in the 1920s weren't nearly as high as they would be after World War II when labor unions come into great prominence and a booming economy and a shortage of workers. Uh, all these three things combined to give a dramatic increase in wages compared to what they had been in years prior. That That's off into the future. In the 1920s, wages were still uh, relatively speaking, low compared to what they would be in the future. So work life was hard. And giving workers an outlet, a leisurely activity to partake in, that was in many ways much, much more enjoyable than the job itself, was a way for companies to, well, get people to come work for them. And it appeared to work. City leagues were very, very, very popular around the United States. And the first companies that fielded teams that were part of, therefore, this initial 1928 organization of the Lansing City League, which is known as the Lansing Baseball Federation at the time, included Novo Engine, Michigan Screw, Arbaugh's, which was a big department store in Lansing, for you Lansing history aficionados, you know that the Arbaugh's department store building is still there. It's a Now it's a red brick uh, colored building that stands at the corner of Kalamazoo Street and Michigan Avenue right in downtown Lansing. That would be the southeast corner of Kalamazoo Street and Michigan Avenue. And it's actually right next door to the AFL-CIO hall here in Lansing. And Arbaugh's was one of the major retail stores that had developed in, at the time period. So they fielded a team or, or were part of this initial Lansing Baseball Federation organization, as was the QP Hotel, Best Radiator, and Atlas Drop Forge. And so many of those companies are, even though on that initial organization there's only six teams, but nonetheless, many of those give us a... Uh, sense. Well, they all give us a sense 
of what the economy uh, looked like and where people worked at the time. And that's, in, in my mind anyways, one of the always fascinating things to consider about uh, city leaks is the fact that when you look at a city like Lansing at this time period and you consider who uh, the teams were that were playing in these leagues, you get a sense of what the economy of the area looked like at the time and what people did for a living. And baseball becomes a very important part of that working world. There were other organizations and companies that ended up eventually fielding their own city league teams, including the uh, postal workers and the police and fire departments here in the city of Lansing. And one of the more interesting aspects of City League Baseball, not only here in Lansing, but in other places as well, was this formation of these teams that became known as barnstorming teams. And these were essentially semi-pro traveling teams that some of which made quite a name for themselves. And the term semi-pro is what came to be used to describe the uh, level of play for the City League team. Semi-pro because the players were kind of professional, but not really. They were professional in the sense that in playing for a City League team, they were paid employees of the team because the team was fielded by the companies that sponsored them. But their pay wasn't really for playing baseball independent of being hired by and they're both for employed by uh, the company or the organization that sponsored the team. So that's why they're called semi-pro. But these teams were extremely popular in the city leagues that sprang up all around the United States. And oftentimes they would play these barnstorming teams. And the term barnstorming was a term that dates back to this time period, talking the 1920s, where it was a, a term that was given to something that would travel making quick fantastic presence uh, presentation around the country. And the barnstorming teams did exactly this, and they would travel from city to city playing local teams. One of the very popular barnstorming teams that came to Lansing and played from time to time, that came to a lot of other cities in Michigan too, was a team from a religious commune called the House of David. House of David has a, a fascinating story to it. It was what uh, what we nowadays would probably call a religious commune, a community that was set up in sort of an ideal way of living according to the religious beliefs of its founders. And the House of David has its home in Benton Harbor. Their baseball team was well known because of the way that the uh, the men appeared. And that is they all wore very long beards. And that was part of their religious belief system, actually, why they wore their hair that way. But their, their long beards were an absolute telltale, recognizable uh, feature of their appearance on the baseball diamond, as well as in other aspects of public life. And, and the House of David stars traveled around and played various city league teams, including here in Lansing, where they made their presence known. And the city leagues in Lansing initially played in a location that I discussed in the previous episode, Municipal Park, which was a park that was on East Michigan Avenue, about a mile, mile and a half from the Michigan State Capitol building. The city leagues played in other locations around the city, too, including a baseball field that Durant Motors had built for their employees and at a the Michigan Vocational School for Boys, which was started as a uh, reform school, actually, for troubled youth that no longer exists in Lansing, but it did at the time. And, and other locations around the city as well, including many that I had mentioned in the previous episode. So... Go ahead and check that episode out if you're looking for more information on where some of these teams played. So the sport of baseball in Lansing as it existed before World War II is uh, very much a look into the cultural development of a city such as Lansing. 
And that is one of the truly fascinating things about examining how baseball, how baseball became part of American culture and American society in these formidable years of the nation's development. 1941 is the really the, the uh, stopping point of what I would call the olden days of Lansing baseball, and that would be because of, of course, World War II. The United States enters the Second World War at the end of 1941, having already been uh, involved in the armament of the nations that would become American allies during the war. But after the U.S. enters the war at the end of 1941, the uh, availability of young men to field baseball teams or the availability of any worker to have the spare time or the companies to have the spare resources to field baseball teams is put on hold due to the demands of the Second World War. The City Leagues come back, and professional baseball also eventually comes back to Lansing. For now, that is going to conclude our look at this era of Lansing baseball. Heard something that you want to learn more about on the show? Heard something that you think, hey, actually, I've got a slightly different version of that story, and I want to let you know about it. Or any other thoughts, comments, questions, concerns, drop me a message. You can find my contact details, along with details of all of the other programming and hosts we have on the LCC Connect series at lccconnect.org. You've been listening to Land Stories with me, David Seawick. For more information on this program and to stream past episodes, visit lccconnect.org. LCC Connect is the official home of the voices, vibes, and vision of Lansing Community College, offering hours of original and exciting programming. Hosted by faculty, staff, and community members, LCC Connect explores our college's work in the community, important topics in higher education, and our vision for the future. Catch the vibe on 89.7 FM or online at lccconnect.org. Until next time, remember, keep telling good stories.